Hey guys, how you doing? Welcome back to another video. The channel has grown significantly in the past couple months and we've picked up a lot of new people. And so naturally a lot of you are not familiar with a lot of these concepts, one circle, two circle, radius, rate, um, the MAR, the crank, uh, Fox 1, Fox 2, Fox 3. Um, these are things that we're gonna talk about in this video, very basic explanations. I'm not gonna go too deep and uh, you know get too complicated, but I just wanna show you guys the basics and make sure that you understand so that you can follow along in future videos. Okay, let's go ahead and get started. So the one I really wanna start with is the difference between a one circle and a two circle fight. I get this question all the time. Uh, so we're gonna have a look here. The one circle fight is a nose to nose radius fight in an attempt to get to the bandit's control zone. We're gonna have a look at what the control zone is in a second, uh, but you can see this image on the screen here. This is a one circle fight. Um, generally in a merge, it is, this is how you can identify it, is you get one bandit that turns this way, and the second bandit that he's merging with will turn this way as well. Essentially forming one circle is how you can remember it. All right, let's have a look at what the control zone means, and we'll come back here. So what is the control zone? The control zone is a cone behind the bandit where the attacker has room to maneuver to prevent an overshoot caused by sudden maneuvering. It is a zone where the offensive aircraft controls the fight completely and the defender has to purely react to the offensive aircraft and is forced to maneuver in relation to the offensive aircraft. The goal of the offensive aircraft is to arrive in the control zone with range angles and closure under control. And so this is the general area of the control zone. It's kind of back here. You don't want to be too close to the bandit over here because sudden movements could force you to squirt out in front and he has now forced an overshoot. So you kind of want to just sit back here in the perfect uh, little area. Now the parameters of the control zone uh, are dependent on the bandit aircraft. So where this cone is exactly um, is dependent on what this is, what kind of aircraft you're fighting. And so an example of that would be if this was a Sukhoi and he was capable of doing a Cobra, you know, and you, you want to be sitting a little bit further back if that's the case, your control zone moves back a little. So if he suddenly reduces speed, you still have a shot. You can, you know, reposition or do whatever you have to do to stay behind him. That's kind of one of the major reasons where we talk about BFM and the Cobra being ineffective in a BFM engagement. Uh, in a guns only fight or something like that is because technically if the offensive aircraft is situated correctly in the control zone, say it's back here, let's just pretend, then if he does do a Cobra, assuming that he's a Sukhoi 27 or something, um, you're still in the correct position to kill him or to stay in control of the fight. So that is the control zone. Okay, so now we know what the control zone is. Let's look at this definition again. A one circle fight is a nose to nose radius fight in an attempt to get to the bandit's control zone. Okay, and here we have once again the definition of control zone if you've already forgotten it. And uh, so radius is one half the size of an aircraft's turn circle. Offensively, a smaller turn radius permits a turn inside the defender's turn circle to achieve a weapon solution. Defensively, a smaller turn radius will deny a weapon solution and force the, the offensive aircraft to fly outside the turn circle. Okay, so let's look at this. If you were the Sukhoi here and, you know, you got in a one circle fight, this is an F-15, um, you pull the Cobra button and you pull a really tight circle, um, F-15 does a massive circle. You know, he's got a lot of speed, so he ends up way out here. You can see that right here you have a weapon solution you have your Fox 2 shot, and he still hasn't got the nose around to take that shot on you. So the fact that you did a tighter circle or a smaller radius uh, allowed you to get into a offensive position for a weapon solution sooner than he could. And so that's the offensive action. In a defensive action, you can see that this Sukhoi 27 is actually safe from the F-15 because he's got a tighter circle. F-15 still doesn't have a shot. So he's, you know, offensively superior and defensively, he's also in a better position. And just before we go to the two circle, I just want to touch on one more thing. Once again, to help you remember, um, notice how this was a nose to nose fight. Okay. So both noses turning towards each other, as explained earlier, that's another way to remember it. Okay. Nose to nose fight. 
Okay, let's go to two circle. All right, and now we're looking at the two circle fight. So the two circle fight is a nose to tail rate fight in an attempt to get to the bandit's control zone. There's that word again, control zone. On the screen here, you have an example of the two circle. Um, a nice way to remember it is, you know, you got one aircraft is making one circle and the other one is making another circle. So you end up with almost like a figure eight. This is a two circle. This is a two circle rate fight. The turn rate is defined in terms of number of degrees per second of heading change on a given turn circle. The aircraft with the higher turn rate travels around the circle quicker and achieves a fire solution sooner than the aircraft with the slower turn rate. Okay, so that's obviously something you would have seen in all the videos when we do our rate fights. If the Sukhoi 27 can get a rate of, let's say 13 degrees a second, okay, and let's just pretend, I'm just throwing arbitrary numbers out there. Um, the F-15 can get, I don't know, something crazy. Like let's say he can get 32 degrees a second, which is insane, 32 is really high. Um, what's going to happen is you see a dramatic difference between these two aircraft in terms of rate. That means by the time the Sukhoi 27 gets maybe here in the circle, the F-15 has come all the way around and he's probably here and very close to a fire solution, right? And the Sukhoi 27 is still nose very far away and the F-15's pretty much got nose on a couple more degrees and he's gonna kill him. So this is what you would define as the number of degrees per second of heading change on a given turn circle. That's what that means. All right, so now that we have a better understanding of you know the one circle, two circle, this is the next question I get a lot. What does it mean when you say a bandit is hot, bandit is cold, um, all these things. So let's pretend that we are this F-18 over here and this is the bandit, the MiG-29 over here. When you say the bandit is hot, what you're saying is that his nose is pointed towards you. Okay, he's coming towards you. He's nose hot. Okay. Alternatively, when you say bandit is cold, what you're saying is that, you know, his nose is pointed away from you. Uh, that's what going cold means, bandit cold. If you said like, I'm going cold, what you're implying is that you are turning away from the bandit. Let's pretend the bandit is like this. He's coming towards you and you go cold. That means you're turning away from the bandit, nose away from the bandit. Uh, in this picture here, the MiG-29 is cold to the F-18. And the last and final position is flanking. Bandit is flanking. This means that he is perpendicular to your flight path. He's flying this way, you're flying this way. Bandit is flanking. He's neither hot nor cold, he is flanking. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about the minimum abort range or MAR. This is the minimum distance between your aircraft and the bandit where you must abort to avoid being hit by the bandit's missile. If you are inside the MAR, the only way to survive is to decoy the missile. That's with a countermeasure or you know a notch or something like that. The minimum abort range is dependent on these factors, altitude, the type of missile being fired at you, and the speed that it was fired. Now I put speed in parentheses. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, it's altitude, so it changes based on altitude. The MAR in DCS on the deck is 10 miles. At high altitudes at 30,000 feet, it's 30 miles. The reason for that is because of the thinner air, the missile can travel a further distance. Therefore, at higher altitudes, the MAR is bigger. Okay, the type of missile being fired at you is obviously important because, you know, you get the R27ER versus what if it's an AMRAM fired at you. Obviously, the performance differences of the missiles will affect what the, the, the minimum abort range is. And finally, we have speed. The reason I put speed in parentheses is technically because it, it does affect the MAR, but you're always going to assume that the bandit is taking the highest probability of kill shot, which means you're always going to assume that your bandit is fast. He's, even if he's Mach 1, you're always going to assume he's at least Mach 1, okay? Even if he's Mach 1.5, you're going to assume he's Mach 1.5 even if he's Mach 1. So you're going to assume worst case scenario in order to determine um, what the minimum abort range is. So the next thing we're going to talk about is the crank. You hear me talk a lot about cranking in BVR videos and things like that. To crank is to maneuver beyond the effective range of a missile. It implies illuminating the bandit at radar gimbal limits in beyond visual range combat. So what does that mean? So let's say that we are this F-15 here and we're flying straight, right? We're flying this way. 
uh, missile is fired at us, it's this missile here, let's say it's just come off the rail, um, what we're going to do is turn right like this, and you know, we get this angle off here. This angle off is going to be the gimbal limit. Now, what, what does gimbal limit mean? Um, you have a radar dish in the tip of your nose in every aircraft. Okay, this is your radar. It is on a gimbal. That means it can turn. So, like, let's pretend this is your radar dish. It can turn a certain degrees this way and a certain degrees this way. Okay, so your gimbal limit is this radar dish, this radar dish looking this way. Okay, that's the maximum distance that it can turn this way and look at the bandit. This is the gimbal limit. For a lot of aircraft, it's different. Let's say this is once again our line. It depends how many degrees off you can go. Some aircraft can go 140, you know, 150, 160 degrees. Um, that really depends on your aircraft, but um, dependent on how far your gimbal limit is, you're going to crank to the gimbal limit. Okay, now what does this achieve? What it does is this missile that was fired at you will be forced to turn. Missiles have a finite fuel. So the, the burn of the missile may have ended here. This is where the fuel ends. The rest of the missile, the rest of the journey the missile has to make on what the kinetic energy it already has from the, the, the motor and the fuel that it burned to get here in the first place. From here on out, it's on its own kinetic energy. Every time that you make a missile turn, you are bleeding its energy a little bit. So when you're turning and you're offsetting, forcing the missile to choose a lead off in front of you, like over here, instead of just flying straight at it and letting it hit you in the face, you're increasing the missile's flight time, right? This is a longer distance to travel than a straight line to hit you in the face. Increased flight time is going to have more friction, more drag on it, okay? The battery may run out. And essentially, you are maneuvering beyond the effective range of the missile. You are reducing the effectiveness of the missile. Alternatively, what you're doing is you got your gimbal, you got your, your radar, you know, staring at this guy, guiding in the missile that you fired. This is your AMRAM, and you're guiding it to Pitbull so that it can hit the target. And basically, you, you've already fired your missile, you fired it here maybe and the missiles traveled all this distance and you're offset. So you're doing all of these things, you're reducing the, the effectiveness of the bandit's missile while at the same time continuing to provide guidance information for your missile to hit him. Okay, this is the crank. It is an encompassment of all of these things together in one concept is called the crank. Okay, and last but not least, we're going to talk about Fox codes. Fox 1, 2, 3. Um, a lot of people have said that they thought Fox code meant, you know, first missile you fire is Fox 1, second one you fire is Fox 2, Fox 3, so on, so on. Um, that is incorrect. So what is a Fox 1? It is a semi-active radar-guided missile. The Fox 1, 2, 3 is a code determining what kind of missile you fired okay what kind of guidance system that missile is using to hit the target a semi-active radar guided missile is something like a sparrow okay uh, a sparrow aim seven sparrow um, is a fox one and what that means is this missile requires information from the launch aircraft in order to hit the target um, that you know illuminating the target so the missile can see it and hit it should the launch aircraft be destroyed, this missile goes stupid. It's also destroyed, okay? This is a FOX-1, semi-active radar guided. The next missile type is the FOX-2, the infrared guided missile. This is your AIM-9 Sidewinder um, heat seekers. This is when you fire them, the seeker is looking for um, flames, afterburner, heat. That's what it's looking for in order to hit the target. It is fox 2 infrared guided missile and the third kind fox 3 is active radar guided missile this is something like the amram aim 120 it means that this missile requires information from this aircraft from the launch aircraft but should this aircraft go cold or be destroyed this missile has an onboard radar that can take over the guidance okay that's that's the first thing that it means 
and so therefore this missile technically does not require launch information from the aircraft. However, if it loses the launch aircraft too far from the target, it could become ineffective. It does need to be within a certain range in order to be able to see the aircraft with its own radar. The other thing that's being implied when you say FOX-3 is that assuming that this aircraft provides this missile guidance until it gets to a range that it likes, this range is called Pitbull. Pitbull, P-B-U-L-L. Uh, I apologize for my spelling here. I'm writing with a mouse. Pitbull. Um, this means that this missile has switched off getting information from the launch aircraft. It no longer wants it and it uses its own radar in terminal guidance in order to hit the, the bandit. Okay, it's using its own radar. It will at, at any point, at some point during this launch, this missile will take over and use its own radar to hit the target. The other really nice thing about the Fox 3s is they can be, they can be fired in um, SAM mode, situational awareness mode, or TWS or TWIS. Um, this means that they will not send a notification to the aircraft um, unless they go pitbull. When they go pitbull, then he gets the RWR warning. Until then, it's completely quiet. He'll have no idea that a missile was fired at him. But the Fox 1s, they do give an RWR warning. They give an RWR right off the rail because they have to be fired in single target track. RWR warning right off the rail with Fox 1. Fox 3, not so much. You can fire in TWS. They can be silent until pitbull. And when it comes to Fox 2s, the seeker head, there's no emission of radar like, uh, like you know, Fox 1, Fox 3. So there is no RWR warning for a Fox 2 missile at any point. It is always tracking heat. There is no radar, so there's no RWR warning for the bandit. The only way to know that a Fox 2 was fired at you is to visually see it, okay? You need to see the missile be fired at you. That being said, there are some aircraft that have systems that can see the flame from the back of a missile and they'll give you a warning, but I'm just speaking very generally. Fox 2s, no RWRs. Okay guys, that's going to be the video for today. Thank you for watching. I hope that you found it useful. Maybe some things you didn't know were answered for you. Uh, and I hope that you can follow along better in videos now going forward. Remember that in the TAC view of every video, we do discuss things in further detail. So if you don't understand something, I will probably talk about it in TAC view. So stick around for that portion. Okay, guys, thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Bye, guys.